Excitement G. Sauer presenting a variety entertainment directed by Rudy Valley. from the stage of the NBC Theater Studio at Times Square. If you will turn to a figure to stage five in your purely imaginary program, you will find our attractions this evening listed as follows. A brace of comedy songs, new to the air and distinctively clever, offered by the Yacht Club Boys, nightclub entertainers, par excellence. A scene from the Moss Hart, George Kaufman comedy, Once in a Lifetime, with Hugh O'Connell and Gene Dixon of the original Broadway cast. A strange interlude, not exactly describable, featuring the young Englishman who attracted so much interest on his first American appearance here some weeks ago, Mr. Oliver Wakefield. A light opera gesture in celebration of St. Patrick's Day, including melodies from two Victor Herbert scores, Eileen and the Princess Pat, with solace and ensemble including Miss Nancy Garner, cousin of the Vice President, and his grand final last spot conducted by a gentleman who, in the opinion of a large body of the populace, is America's cleverest comedian, Mr. Lou Holt. At last, the song dedicated to one of the most controversial figures of this day and age, one at least, whether you like him or dislike him, who deserves the prominence that his clever phrases and originality have gained him. An orchid to you, Mr. Winslow. An orchid to you for your beautiful eyes. An orchid to you. It's plain to see that you are heaven sent. And finding you, my dear, was just a blessed event for your marvelous love. An orchid to you for your kissable lips. Like petals with dew, my song of love is ending. I end it here by sending a great big orchid to you. who stay up late at night and attend the goings-on at cabarets, the Yacht Club boys are old favorites. This, I believe, is their first radio appearance. They write their own songs, sophisticated Broadway anthems notable for a highly original comedy sense. We present Adler, Kelly, Kern, and Mann. The Yacht Club boys. Attention, please, attention. We just came back from the coast. We brought a big director who was California's toast. He came from Germany and Mr. Cooker brought him fame. He went to Hollywood and revolutionized the game. He's the king of all directors. Would you like to meet him now? Mr. Rubens. Mr. Rubens. Mr. Rubens, Mr. Rubens take, take a, a bow. bow. I'm going to make a picture that will be a big surprise. We are here for stages and we're here to advertise. Boy, sharpen up your pencil, start to ballyhoo today. To describe a Rubens picture, this is what we have to say. It's colossal, tremendous, gigantic, stupendous. <laughs> the super special picture of the year. Marvelous. It's amazing, titanic, terrific, dynamic. It has a 
a La Farva laugh You're the boy. Oh. It'll cost a million dollars. It'll take a year to do. I use Garble Gable, Machiavellian, Guna, Guna, too. It's colossal. Tremendous. Gigantic. Stupendous. The super special picture of the year. Yeah. Now every Rubik's picture is a classic of the screen. I'll show you how I make them. Let's pretend this is a scene. Everybody on the set has Rubik's has begun. Lights, action, camera, we are shooting number one. Am I ready? Yes. 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 I am ready. Mr. Rubik's is a genius. He's a wow. Oh, if you get me 20 bedrooms, a thousand yards of linen, yes. you got me 90 horses and a lot of gorgeous yes. Yes. Are you ready for the fade out? We're blowing up the Howard. I don't think that you can stop because we have no Mickey Mouse. No Mickey Mouse. No Mickey Mouse. No Mickey Mouse. The scene is out. It's colossal. Tremendous. Gigantic. Stupendous. The super special picture of the year. It's amazing. Titanic. Terrific. Dynamic. It has a thrill of marvel apathy. Why he's using six fat women, though they're homely, he don't mind. They don't fold the grass of the front of the galley from behind. It's colossal. Tremendous. Gigantic. Stupendous. The super special picture of the year. There must be an easy way for us to make a living. <laughs> this next song tells a very beautiful story. It tells of how they used to bury the dead in Paris 2,000 years ago. They take a man who was dead, place his body on a wooden box, place the box on four pillars, and for three days and three long nights, 20 beautiful women dance around the box. Then if he don't get up, they bury him. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Ladies and gentlemen, I have studied genealogy here, here. Here, with the intention of discovering my family tree. Here, here. Here. I find I can trace my ancestors back to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Elizabeth New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> here, here. My ancestors are known for the brave deeds they've done. Here, here. And in ancient times, for the many wars they've won. Here, here. Why, my great-grandfather practically lived on Napoleon. Napoleon <laughs> Brandy. Very good. <laughs> my family can be traced back to King Solomon yeah, yeah, yeah. and Moses and Abraham and all the holy men. Yeah, yeah. My forefathers once concealed some of the prophets. The prophets, but not the losses. My forefathers were founders of America. Yeah, yeah. In Washington, you find my permanent address. Yeah. Why, right now, my father's in uniform at the Capitol. And his uncle <laughs> is at the Roxy. It's in the blood. A glorious mission to follow tradition. The men who are gallant and bold. It's in the blood. With courage of mind, we'll fight for the right like our father before us of old. For generations, raw blood's been in my every vein. Where the descendants of the bourbon line in one unbroken chain. Until a year ago, my uncle was the king of Spain. Now what does he do? Nothing. Oh, he's in business. <laughs> it's in the blood. The way that we walk and the way that we talk and the way that the way that hey, waiter, it's in the blood. Our family treasure. To put to the test of such an appointment in grand. I spring from old King Solomon with all the thousand wives. Since that time, my ancestors have led platonic lives. Right now, my aunt has more husbands than Solomon had wives. And who's your aunt? And guess who? May well. Sorry, you know, you've heard of us. I don't know how you feel about this tune, pretending you care, but it's one of my favorites. is almost through. Love that I hold dear, I find insincere. 
Though you make believe it's true Pretending that you care But someone else tonight will share a kiss From lips divine That you were pretending were mine Pretending you'll be true I thought I could depend on you Whatever might be fall But you were pretending that's all Though your arms still hold me As close as they did before Though you've never told me I know what's in store For I know that your pretending love lives on When in your heart the thrill is gone Oh, why be so unfair And keep on pretending you care Present now an episode from Once in a Lifetime by Moss Hart and George S. Kaufman with Hugh O'Connell and Gene Dixon of the original New York cast in the roles played on the screen by Jack Oakey and Aileen McMahon. Hal Vanille completes the cast. The scene is a cheerless and utterly uninviting furnished room in the West 40s, the time 1928, New York City. George Lewis, a small-time vaudeville performer, is seated in an easy chair cracking Indian nuts with his teeth and reading Variety, the show business trade paper. George, played by Mr. O'Connell, is a likable fellow, but not quite bright. There is a knock on the door and May Daniels enters. May, played by Miss Dixon, is one of George's two stage partners, and she makes up his deficiency in brains with plenty to spare. With a glance, she takes in George Variety and the Indian nuts, then sits dejectedly on the edge of the bed, listening to the crack of nut after nut. Hello, George. Jerry not back yet, huh? No. Anything new since this afternoon? You haven't heard anything, have you? No. You're going to stay here and talk, May? I'm reading. Hey, what time is Jerry coming back, you know? He went to a show. <laughs> it's wonderful how you two take it. You off to ball games every day, Jerry going to shows. How about the old vaudeville act? Are we going to get bookings or aren't we? I don't know anything about that, May. I'm reading. Still variety? Mm-hmm. One of these days, you'll pick up a paper that's written in English, and you'll have to send out for an interpreter. What do you mean, May? Variety is in English. All right, George. It has news of the show world from different countries, but it's all in English. I said all right, George. Want some Indian nuts? No, thanks. Don't your teeth ever bother you? No, why? Oh, I don't know. After all those darn things you've eaten... Do you realize, George, that you've left a trail of Indian nuts clean across the United States? If you ever commit a crime, they can go right to you. Uh. You've thrown them shells under radiators in every dollar and a half hotel from here to Seattle. I can visualize hundreds of chambermaids the country over coming in the morning you check out and murmuring blessings on your head. Don't you ever get bad dreams, George, with that on your mind? Listen to me. You're going to keep on talking till Jerry gets here? What's Jerry up to, George? Is he going to land us something or isn't he? How much longer are we going to hang around here? Don't ask me. Ask Jerry. Well, I'm going to, and we'll have a showdown tonight. The automat don't sell home to me. Why, May, we don't live there. We do everything but sleep there, and we'd be doing that if they could get beds in them slots. Got to have some patience, May. We've only been here four weeks. Listen, George. Dumb as you are, you ought to be able to get this. The bank book says there's just $128 left. 
$128, get that? Sure. Well, how long do you think three people can live on that? With Jerry going to opening nights and you taking in the World Series. Oh, something will turn up. It always does. Well, I'm glad you like those lousy things, because the way things are going, you may have to live on them in another week. Why, me? Nobody could live on Indian nuts. There's not enough to them. Look, see? That's all they are. All right, George. Well, I suppose it's another week of hanging around offices and another series of those nickel-plated dinners. I'm so sick of the whole business I could yell. You're just blue, man. I wouldn't wonder. Living alone in that hall bedroom without even the crack of an Indian nut to cheer me up. Well, I wanted to do it, and here I am. I guess it's better than selling 90-cent perfume to the feminine population of Connellsville, PA, but there's times when I wish I was back there. Maybe we'll play there someday. It wouldn't surprise me. I wonder if we'll ever play Medallion, Ohio. I haven't been back in four years. Has it got an automat? I don't think so. We'll never play it. Hmm. Jerry played it once. There's where he discovered me. He played the theater I was working in. I was an usher. Yeah, I remember. Too bad that was free Roxy, George. You'd have had a career. If I'd have stayed, I might have been a lieutenant. One of the fellows who started with me is a major. Do you think they'll ever have conscription for theater ushers? Then Jerry came along and saw me and offered me this job. He said I was just right for it. Hmm. He had a good eye. As far as I'm concerned, you're the best deadpan feeder in all show business. Well, don't the audiences like me, too? Well, no one ever had kittens in the aisle, George, but you're all right. I love doing it, too. The longer we play the act, the more I like it. Say, George, you and Jerry have been bunking together for four years. Isn't Jerry a swell guy? Been a wonderful friend to me. You know, I wouldn't tell this to him, George, but I'll never forget what I owe Jerry Hyland. And don't you go telling him either. I won't tell him. How much do you owe him? Oh, George. Please stop eating those things. They're going to your head. I don't mean that I owe him any money, but he's never made me feel that we were anything but good friends, or that I'd have to feel any ways else to keep the job. He's never made me feel anything either. Well, that's just dandy. Me? Shall I tell you something? I wish you would. I think Jerry likes you. All right, George. No, I mean likes you a whole lot. Okay, George. The question is, what do we do about bookings? Are we going to crash the big time or aren't we? We were doing all right on the small time. We could be working right along. You know what the booking office told us. And you know where the booking office books us. Bellows Falls, Vermont. <laughs> I liked it there. What? We had a good dinner there with chocolate pudding. George. Don't you want to do anything else all your life and knock about all over the map as a small-time vaudeville actor? No. You don't, huh? No. Well, I guess that settles that, doesn't it? You might as well go ahead and read. Well, I feel like talking now. Well, I feel like reading now. Hi, people. Well, here we are. When do we play the palace? What did you sell for the last half in Bridgeport? May, it's here. You got booking? Is it the palace? Never mind about that. I've got some news for you. I saw a history made tonight. What are you talking about? I've just been to the opening of Al Jolson's talking picture, The Jazz Singer. Oh, what of it? And I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing in the world. Oh, there have been good pictures before. I'm Jerry. not talking about the picture. I mean the Vitaphone. The what? The, the Vitaphone. The talkie. They talk. Oh, that. That. Yeah, you ought to hear them cheering, May. Everybody went nuts. I tell you, May, it's going to revolutionize the entire industry. It's something so big, I bet even the Vitaphone people don't know what they've got yet. You've got to hear it, May, and to realize what it means. Why, in six months from now... Oh, come out of it, Jerry. What are you getting so head up about? It's no money in your pocket, even if it is good. No. No? Well, we're leaving for Los Angeles in the morning. What did you say? We're leaving for Los Angeles in the morning. What time? Are you out of your mind? Don't you understand, May? For the next six months, they won't know which way to turn. All the old standbys are going to find themselves out in the cold. And somebody with brains and sense enough to use them is going to get in into big dough. The movies are back where they were when the DeMills and the Laskies first saw what they were going to amount to. Can't you see what it would mean to get in now? Well, what do you mean, get in, Jerry? What did we do out there? Act or what? No, no, no. Acting is small potatoes from now on. You can't tell with what we will do. Direct. Give orders. Tell them how to do things. There's no limit to where we can go. Yeah, but what do we know about it? Good this? Lord, May, we've been doing nothing but playing the act in all the small town houses in the country. Suppose we do cut loose and go out there. What have we got to lose? $128. Oh, shut up, George. I don't know, We've got to get out there, May, before this Broadway bunch climbs on the bandwagon. Or there's going to be a gold rush, May, or there's going to be a trek out to Hollywood that'll make the 49ers look sick. You mean there's gold in them hills, Jerry? (laughs) Yeah, gold and the black marble swimming pool. 
with the Jap chauffeur waiting outside the Iron Grill gate. <laughs> All that and more, May, if we can work it right and get in now. But they're panic-stricken out there. They'll fall on the neck of the first guy that seems to know what it's all about. And that's why we got to get there quick. Yeah, but you got to give me time to think, Jerry. Suppose we don't land something right away. How are we going to live? You heard what the boy Wonder said. $128. I've got 500 more. What? I've got 500 more right here. Where'd you get it? No, 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 don't yell, May. I, I, I sold the axe. You did what? I, I sold the axe. I took one look at that picture and I sold the axe outright to Eddie Garvey and the Sherman sisters for 500 cash. Oh, no, no, don't get sore, May. It was no, the only I'm thing to do. I'm getting sore, Jerry, but... You sold the axe to the Sherman sisters? Look, if people once took a mule in a covered wagon just because they heard of some mud that looked yellow and endured hardship and went all the way across the country with their families and fought Indians even, what think what it'll mean, May, if we went out? No more traveling all over the country, living in one place. Okay, instead... Jerry, I'm with you. You had a terrible nerve to count me in. Good for you. How about you, George? Huh? Now, are you willing to take a chance with us? Leave all this behind you and cut loose for Hollywood. Well, look, if you sold the axe. Sure, I sold the axe. We're going out and try this new game. Now, what do you say? Come on, George. Well, it's the chance of a lifetime. Well, what'll we do out there? Well, we can talk that over on the train. The important thing is to get out there and to get there fast. Yeah, but if you sold the act... Listen, George, we're giving up the act. We're not going to do the act anymore. Don't you understand that? Yeah, but he sold the act. I understand he sold the act. Look, George, there's a new invention called talking pictures. In these pictures, the actors will not only be seen, they will also talk. For the first time in the history of pictures, they will use their voice. Oh, hey. I've got an idea. What? I think I know what they're going to do out there. Well? Most of those bozos have never talked on a stage. They've never spoken lines before. Well, they got to learn, that's all. Sure they do, and who's going to teach them? We'll open a school of elocution and voice culture. What? what? Open a school, Jerry. Teach them how to talk. They're sure to fall apart because they'll be scared stiff. We'll let them come to us instead of our going to them. Yeah, but, but, but us with the school, May, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> Maybe you don't, but I went to one once and it's easy. Yeah, but what do you have to do? Can I learn it? Sure, anyway, I'll do all that. Well, what are you going to do? Oh, oh, shut up a minute. Will you let me think? No, maybe, maybe you got hold of something. A school of elocution. It might not be a bad idea. What's elocution? It's a swell idea, and if I know actors, Jerry, they'll come running. Why, between you and me and the lamppost here, it's the best idea anybody ever had. How soon are we going to leave? Tomorrow. I, I want to see the picture first. Okay, 25 of that 500 goes to books on elocution the first thing in the morning. I'm going to learn this racket and know the reason why. Well, what'll I do? I don't know anything about elocution. You don't know anything about anything, George, and if what they say about the movies is true, you will go far. So help me, Jerry, it'll work like... It's John. You watch and see if it doesn't. It's coming back to me already. I remember lesson number one. Well, if you're sure you can get away with it, please. Oh, it's a sense, George. Just watch. Come here. Come here, George. Huh? Say, California, here I come. Huh? Now, don't argue, say it. California, here I come. Now then. Stomach in and chest out. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's the other way around. No, that's right. Stomach in and chest out. Now, say it again. California, here I come. Now, this time with feeling. You're about to start on a great adventure. The covered wagon is slowly moving across the plains to a marble swimming pool. Come on, George. Give it everything. California, here I come. Yay! It works, Jerry. It works. And if it works on George, it'll work on anybody. California, here we come. Indian nuts to mud. I'm nuts about mud. Each other, they're always ready for play. 
I could watch those puppies all day. I'm nuts about much, funny little much, every kind of bow wow wow. I see you wagging little tails, fuzzy wuzzy tails at me. I'm nuts about much, funny little much, shaking up a shoe so happily. Rolling on the floor, barking at the door, tickles me. I've got one of those. Goodness only knows he's no thoroughbred. But oh, how he watches that kid of mine in bed. I'm not about much, funny little much, any little bow wow wow. I see looking for a friend, always can depend on me. Play the waltz that so many of you seem to enjoy. We're repeating it again tonight. Poem. G. Sauer under the direction of Rudy Valley, who presents the Yacht Club Boys, Ewell O'Connell, Gene Dixon, and Harold Vermilia, Nancy Garner, Alma Kitchell, and the International Quartet, Lou Holtz, and Oliver Wakefield. A few weeks ago, we were fortunate enough to be able to introduce to this audience Oliver Wakefield, a young English lecturer. Although Mr. Wakefield has been in this country, or had been in this country, only two weeks at that time, his grasp of our national problems proved only less remarkable than the clarity with which he set them forth. Tonight, just back from a tour of 30 states, he offers a solution. His message is entitled, Forward America. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Oliver Wakefield. Hello, everybody. I, I'm I'm terribly pleased you could all stagger around tonight and, and listen because I, I've been asked this evening to say a, a few words on 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 the general, so, so to get 
right down to, to, to the bottom of, of, of things and, and, and find out where we, we stand and, 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 and get behind ourselves and, and try, because I, I feel that, that every one of you listening in has some, something in you. And, and I, I mean, if you haven't, it, it, it's most. Because I, I, I feel that, that in every one of you there is a stagnant something which is dormant. And I, I mean, which, which only requires a, a vital a something which is not a, a stagnant to sort of bring, bring out the, the worst in you. And I, I mean, when you to take the, the naval the, the, the situation, I, I mean, that the, the only thing to do in, in this country is to keep the, the ship at, at sea. Keep, keep, them, keep them out. Because I, I need these sailor men. You know, they, they get married from time to, to places, and I, I mean, they sort of have a wife in, in every porthole, and I, I mean, it makes it, it, makes it so, so, so difficult for us to, to know exactly how far and, and, and when. Because, I, I mean, whenever, whenever I, I see a ship okay, coming into the, the United, uh, up the Hudson, and uh, down the east and, and, and west, uh, I say, G get out. You see, get out. We, we don't want you in, in, in here. And, of course, in, the, in that way, you keep your harbors free from uh, uh, cigarette ends and, and orange. Uh, because, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's another thing. We, as, as a nation of, of shoplift, uh, shop war, empire, uh, uh, free, uh, must eat more fruit. Because in the body, there are millions and millions of, of tiny little black and white uh, uh, corporals and, and I mean, they go round and round and, and round in, in the body well the trouble is they go the other way and you burst and you're ingrained and I, I mean it's, it, 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 it's, it's simply I mean, because I, I mean beauty it is akin to uh, near as, as makes no and to quote that uh, that well-known uh, uh, songwriter, uh, composer, uh, Irving, uh, 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 Germany, uh, hit uh, 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 Berlin. I, I, I mean, life, life is, is just a bowl of, um, of, 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 of cherries, which must be a nip in, in the bud. And, and the, the, the pit must be expected to the, the, the four winds before you can reach your harvest of American uh, uh, sweet corn, uh, uh, grapes. And, uh, and I, I mean, I mean, to me, to me, life, life is, is a race. That the winner to take the, the, the cherries, he can do what he jolly well likes with the with the. I mean, of course, the foreign situation is practically in in the same. It can be because the Near East is, is not so, so far as, as the Far East on account of the. the and I, I mean, they, they take the, the turk. They they eat the Turkish delight, and they get a frog bun, and they're always fighting. For the, the, the Dardanelles. Well, I, 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 what, what I always say is give them one or two of these uh, Dardy uh, things, but, but I, I mean, they, they multiply and, and you get lots of uh, a little. Uh, and I, I mean, the Greeks again, I mean, they're, they're always shooting their, their government officials at, at, at dawn on an empty uh, stomach. And I, I mean, I mean, when a man. Once shot at, at dawn on an empty, uh, I, I need, he's never the same. There's, there, there's always some little, because I, mean, I, I had a pretty decent upbringing, and I was always taught that the, the way to, to a man's heart was through his stomach, I mean, the way to a man's stomach was through his pocket, and I mean, all, all roads lead to, 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 to Rome, home, and, and I, I'm Nero. Nero fiddled while his home burned, and, and most, most of you Americans managed to fiddle a, a, a living on, on the, 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 the quiet. Because, I, I mean, what, what I asked did Abraham Lincoln say, say to, to Ginsburg uh, at, uh, <laughs> at, at uh, uh, Gettys um, uh, doing? I, I mean, he said, he said his, his message to two and mine also is stand up. But put your back to the, the, the wheel, your, your shoulder uh, to, to Walt uh, Brooklyn uh, and get one foot out of the grave and, and, and put it on the bottom of the page and, and turn over a, a new leaf. Thank you.
show you the dexterity of some of the Yankees, I selected Cliff Burwell's arrangement of Sweet Lorraine. Victor Herbert, great Irish American composer, offer to us a fine opportunity to point out that it's a great day for the Irish tonight. We present now a medley of numbers from Eileen and the Princess Pat, arranged by Elliot Jacoby. The International Quartet acts as our male chorus. Yours truly undertakes a duet with Miss Nancy Garner, cousin of the Vice President. And a contralto solo is assigned to Miss Alma Kitchell. The top of the morning shouldn't be got up to you all. <laughs> Come, but 
that feeling, he finds it so appealing that he can't stand the feeling if he tries. In a smile there's a token of promises unspoken, sure there's many a heart been broken by two laughing Irish eyes. chance when you come to Manhattan. The show that begins inauspiciously but ends in a blaze of glory. Jack Haley, Ethel Merman, in fact, all the cast, most adequately chosen and capable, not to forget Jack Whiting. This is one of the best, if not the most popular song in the show, and Alice Fay and I are going to sing it for you. You're an old smoothie. You're an old smoothie. I'm an old softy. I'm just like Patty in the hands of a girl like you. You're an old meanie. I'm a big booby. I just go nutty in the hands of a girl like you. For me, you play me for a pass. For you, you thought you made a trap. Well, dear, I think it's time you knew you've done just what I wanted you to. Silly old smoothie. Pass the old softie. I'll stick like Patty to the hands of a girl like you. You're an old smoothie. I'm an old softie. I'm just like Patty in the hands of a boy like you. You're an old meanie. I'm a big goofy. I just go naughty in the hands of a boy like you. For me, you play the for sap. For you, you thought you laid a trap. Well, dear, I think it's time you knew. You've done just what I wanted you to. Fill the old smoothie. Crash the old softie. I'll stick like party to the hands of a boy like you. Return engagements on the stage are a habit. The radio is no exception either. To present again Broadway's foremost dialectician, the star of You Said It and Manhattan Mary, with his eminent stooge, Mr. H. Leopold Chowalski, in a new comedy act prepared especially for this program. Lou Holt. Hello, 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 hello. Hi ho, everybody. Hi ho. Well, so far. So far, I've enjoyed the show. You know, I've, I've been sitting in that other place, and I heard that fellow, Forward America, cheerio, toodaloo, and shovel. And I want to tell you something. These Indians, that same bag. <laughs> very, very good. Oh, look, I, I must tell you, I, I, I just got a wire. I just got a wire from Eddie Cantor. Of course, I don't have to tell you what a wonderful comedian Eddie Cantor is and what a remarkable fellow he is. But on top of everything... The most amazing thing about Eddie Cantor is he never worries. There's a fella that hasn't got a worry in the world. Well, look, here's a copy of the letter that he just sent me. He said, my dear Lou, he says, I understand that you are going on again tonight on the radio for the second time. He says, I heard you the first time you went on, and I have nothing to worry about. It's amazing. 
My wife ran away with the chauffeur last year. Now I'm as nervous as I can be. Because every time I hear an automobile horn, I think he's bringing her back to me. So, so lovely. Oh, so my you. So I said a fair. Love you, Rebecca. A fat lady tried to get on a streetcar. She didn't know whether to get on in front or behind. The conductor said, which end will you get in, madam? She said, I'll get them both in if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, so are me. Oh, so are you. Lost in a I'm going to do something for you really, really worthwhile. Uh, really, I am. From now, I'm going from the sublime to the jolly old ridiculous. We're going to play a little skit for you, written for us by Mr. George Bernard Shaw and Primo Carnero. <laughs> and if this little skit is a big success, it will be played next season by the Theatre Guild on Wharf Number 7. <laughs> The, the scene is laid in the office of a shoe factory, and seated at the desk is my good friend, Mr. H. Leopold Schawowski. Are you, are you ready to start, Mr. Schawowski? Yeah, yeah. Well, here I come, ready or not. All right. How do you do, how do you do, how do you do, how do you do? How are you? You advertise for a shoe shop salesman? That's right. I would like to grab the position. Okay. What's your name? Max Sapiro. Max what? Max Sapiro. Max Sapiro. You said it? Well, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Sapiro. I don't want you to feel offended. You understand? You said it? But this firm never engages any Hebrews. Has no bearing on me. I'm Filipino. <laughs> You're a what? A Filipino. A Filipino from where? From down there around Manila Bay. I reckon you all never be down there. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I haven't. Very beautiful piece of territory down there, my <laughs> beautiful piece of territory down there, my friend. <laughs> you must come down there sometime. Look me up. I'd like to. Who do I ask for? Just ask for Filipino Matt. <laughs> I'm there with the Filipinos and the Filipinakis. <laughs> The Philippine what? Philippine Yakis. What is that? A very old Filipino. <laughs> An old Filipino. You said it, my friend. How old do they get there? Beg your pardon? How old do they get there? Philippine Yakis? That's right. 1800, 2000? <laughs> they get to be that old? I, of course, I'm a Philippine Yak. Well, I'd like to ask you, how old are you? I'm a baby Philippine Yak. Well, you're a baby. I'm just a kiddie. <laughs> well, how old are you? 527. <laughs> You're 527 years old? You said it. You're very well preserved. I'm tickled all the time. <laughs> you must look me up down there sometime. Say, what makes them grow so old down there? Well, it's really the food. The food, eh? We eat only Filipino food. Mm -hmm. Filipino dishes. Filipino what? Filipino dishes. I see. We got a Filipino food down there called, uh, Gihakso Labor. <laughs> He what? He hot so labor. <laughs> what is that? Liver. <laughs> oh, liver, liver. That is, that is, here you call that chopped liver. <laughs> oh, chopped liver. Not chopped liver, chopped liver. <laughs> oh, chopped liver. Are you sure you ain't a Philippine yacht? <laughs> no, no. You've never been down there, eh? No, I've never been down there. We also have down there a thing what we call ciboli. Ciboli? Ciboli. What is that? That's a fruit. A fruit? A fruit. What kind of fruit is that? It's a round fruit, and when you peel them, you cry. Oh, you mean an onion. Liver and horn, oh, yes. yes. 
It's the beautiful territory down there. That's the mighty nice. You know, we got down there 86 longitude and 86 latitude, yes. which causes an equinox. Causes a what? Causes an equinox. What is that? Well, we have no winter, no summer, no breakfast, no supper, no spring, no fall, and it's always 7.30. <laughs> It's always 7.30. You said it, my friend. Well, uh, I'd like to ask you something. Yeah? Suppose you happen to have a date for 7.30 and you come late. You can't come late. Why not? It's half past seven. Oh, I see. Say, uh, I wouldn't be asking you too much if I asked you where you live down there. Me? Yeah, where do you live? Say, when I live down there? Well, what part of the island? Always live in the slump. <laughs> you live in the swamp? Well, not exactly in the swamps. I live near the swamps in the dump. <laughs> but see here, my friend, you've never been down there, eh? No, I've never been down there. How about the job? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I got a Filipino boy working here for me. Yes. Born and raised in the Philippine Islands. Yes. Now I'll bring him out here. If you speak a little Spanish, I'll give you the job. You got a Filipino boy here? That's right. You sure he's Filipino? Positively. Don't ring in no Portuguese, I mean. <laughs> Now, you wait right here, and I'll bring out this Filipino. His name is Pancho Del Tito Valley. You ever hear of him? Is he a crooner? <laughs> because we have down in the Philippines a crooner. Yeah? His name is Rachmaninoff Valley. <laughs> Same fella. Same fellow? Same guy. Hey, Pancho. Estoy aquí. Estoy aquí. Uh, so you key, you said it, my honey. <laughs> now, Pancho, this fella claims to be a Filipino. I want you to go over and talk a little Spanish to him. If he's okay with you, he gets the job. Go on over and talk to him, Pancho. Hable usted español, señor? What do you say? Hable usted español, señor? You lie. <laughs> Un poquito, no? Hmm? Un poquito, no? Oh, you changed your mind, eh? <laughs> Hable usted español, señor. I want to tell you something, señor Valley. This is between you and me, you understand? As far as this fellow Chualski is concerned, you rob him in drill. <laughs> what do you think about that, señor Valley? Oi, you rob him like a dread. Just a moment, gentlemen. I'd like to tell you both something. What is it, Kowalski? You call our baby in Like party in the hands of a girl like you. You're an old me. I'm a big booby. I just go nutty in the hands of a girl. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> 